Look to move the adjournment. Beg to move this house to now adjourn. Question is this house to now adjourn. George Galloway. Speaker, a government ready to rely on those friends of liberty, the Democratic Unionist Party, to shred the liberties of our own people is almost by definition unembarrassable. But I hope this evening to add to the issues ventilated in a recent Channel 4 dispatches programme to adumbrate the extent to which the tragedy in Somalia, which so many people are now becoming aware of, is another of our government's dirty little secrets. We must start the story in Ethiopia, where four million people, according to the United Nations, are facing starvation, and where 120,000 Ethiopian children have just one month to live, according to last week's media reports. Television viewers were shocked to see the pictures last week about the widespread suffering redolent of 1984 and the Great Famine of that year. The US and Britain immediately pledged $90 million in famine relief. Just one week after its appeal to the international community for famine relief, the Ethiopian government increased its military budget by $50 million to $400 million. The regime in Addis Ababa, when I knew them in the 1980s, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they were pro-Albanian Maoists, is the most militarized and heavily armed in Africa. It is in a state of perpetual war or preparation for war with one neighbor, Eritrea. It is supporting anti-government rebels with Western connivance, many believe, in Sudan. But most astonishing of all, the government of Ethiopia, this starving country whose little children fly infested, kwashior core swollen, famished, famine-stricken children, has been encouraged, armed, trained, financed and otherwise facilitated to invade and occupy its neighbour Somalia and create a reign of terror in that land, which is testified to by this voluminous Amnesty International report, which if I had time, I would extensively quote from. Somalia has lost thousands of dead as a result of the Ethiopian invasion. Millions have been displaced. Somalia, under Ethiopian occupation, is the grimmest prison state in Africa. Worse, far worse than Mugabe's Zimbabwe. And who has done the encouraging, the arming, the training, the financing, and the facilitating? The same US and British governments who donated the $90 million to the same Ethiopian government, which is burning its money and burning the villages, the neighborhoods, and the people of occupied Somalia. This government is never done talking about the shortcomings of African leaders. Just last week in Rome, the Secretary of State for International Development was roaring at Robert Mugabe, yet there has not been a squeak out of him or any other minister about the much bigger crime in which we are ourselves deeply complicit. Is it any wonder that African opinion considers so much of what we have to say about misgovernance in Africa to be the deepest, most cynical hypocrisy? Two weeks ago, Channel 4's dispatches team took terrifying risks to bring us the latest from occupied Mogadishu. It was undoubtedly an award-winning documentary. It was memorable for many reasons, not least the scene in the FCO when the minister, Lord Malach Brown, his face frozen in horror, was confronted by Adam Hartley with the central case of the documentary makers which for those members who didn't see it, I know that the minister will have seen it. She could hardly be sent out to bat on this wicket without being shown it, was this, that in the grim prison state of occupied Somalia, the fingerprints of our country and our government 
are all over the scene of the crime. The president of the puppet regime imposed by the Ethiopian army in Somalia turns out to be British. He spends much of his time here. Well, it's dangerous in Somalia after all. He has property here, family here. He presides over a gang of torturers, murderers, grand larceners, extortionists, and then flies back to England. The police chief, whose police officers kidnap people for ransom, which they extort from people living in our own country, in Leicester, in Birmingham, in London. His police officers torture people. They make them disappear. They kill them if their families will not pay. He's British too, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the former Interior Minister, who presides over an interior of mass refugee camps, starvation and misery, and who stands accused of stealing international aid, of diverting food for political purposes, why he also is British. And guess what? Who is paying the wages of the murdering, kidnapping, torturing, quizzling police force in Ethiopian-occupied Somalia? That's right, we are. The puppet dictatorship in Somalia is a very British crime, especially as our own government, especially the pocket-sized Palmerston, the Secretary of State hitherto referred to, is so very voluble on other problems in Africa. So how did we get here? How did we get into bed with the former pro-Albanian Maoists of the government in Addis Ababa? I'm afraid it's our old friend, our old acquaintance, the policy of my enemy's enemy is my friend. This policy which has put us in so much trouble, from Afghanistan to Iraq and many other parts of the world, is what lies behind this obscene paradox. We are supporting the Ethiopian government's occupation of Somalia because George Bush told us to. Because Somalia is a front line in George Bush's ill-conceived, counterproductive, utterly discredited, about to be booted out in the United States, so-called war on terror. We are against the former government of Somalia because it was an Islamic government. Just as we're against the government in Sudan because it's an Islamic government. Just as Ethiopia on our behalf opposes the government in Eritrea because it's an Islamic government. This policy, having been such a disaster around the world, is now in full force in Somalia. And but for Channel 4's dispatches, hardly anyone in Britain would know anyone about it. No minister has come to the dispatch box to explain why British taxpayers' money is being paid to a police force in Mogadishu, which is accused of kidnapping people and extorting the money for the ransom from British citizens. No British government minister has come to explain, unless one takes Lord Malach Brown's frozen face as explanation, why we are so heavily involved with a puppet regime bereft of political and public support in Somalia. This policy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of backing anyone that Bush tells us to, this policy of backing anyone who's against those which we today perceive ourselves to be against is morally utterly vacuous, but arguably worse than that. It's not only morally vacuous, it's a total dismal failure, as we found in Afghanistan to our bitter, bitter cost, not least this very week. The very mujahids that Mrs. Thatcher's government lauded and supported and armed are now murdering and killing our soldiers oh, oh, in, in Afghanistan. Oh, oh, no. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. To George Galloway. I had the adjournment debate. It was scheduled to start at 7 o'clock for half an hour. It, I've now had 10 minutes, and the country, or those interested, watching on Parliament TV, will not hear the Minister even reply. Everybody the was misunderstood. The adjournment debate is now starting at 7 o'clock. He so far had bonus time.
It's one of the systems we have to go through as far as the House is concerned. Well, that's truly magnificent, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, I have plenty to say. Perhaps I can now quote from Amnesty International in more detail in the time that I didn't think I'd have available. The point is, Mr Deputy Speaker, this policy is not only morally bankrupt, it is also politically disastrous. Afghanistan is the perfect case in point, and Ethiopia, which is presiding, the Ethiopian government presiding over a country where now famine and mass starvation stalks the land, is being helped militarily to invade and occupy its neighbours and threaten other of its neighbours. What can this conceivably do for our standing in Africa? What can this do for our credibility when we lecture the government of Sudan or the government of Zimbabwe? But if our problems on this were confined to Africa, Mr. Deputy Speaker, then that would be bad enough. But it's much, much worse than that. The Somalians are the tallest people on the earth, but they're virtually invisible politically on the international stage and in our own country. But there are hundreds of thousands of Somalians in our country. Hundreds of thousands. Either because they have European Union passports or because they are refugees from the very fighting which we in part are fueling. And their young people are increasingly furious, bitter, angry, nursing their wrath as they watch on the Somali television and elsewhere on other Muslim channels, the carnage in their country. Two million people in a country of 11 million. That's almost a fifth of the population. If it were our population, it would be 12 million people living as refugees. If you want to scale it up, two million refugees inside the country, a million refugees in neighboring countries. God knows how many hundreds of thousands scattered across the European Union. These families, in their bitter exile, are bringing up sons, maybe daughters too, who are bitter and furious at the Western role in the problem that they see rolled out on their television screens in their country. And we, who have just spent <laughs> how many hours trying to deal with the problem of terrorism, cannot see the connection between this constant policy of infuriating young Muslim boys and girls by the double standards and the injustice of our policy towards their countries and the countries their parents come from. We can't see the connection between the growth of extremism. Government's always looking for a cleric to blame or an organization to ban for the radicalization of Muslim youth in Britain. But they don't need a cleric or an organization to radicalize them, Mr. Deputy Speaker. They just have to watch the news. They just have to watch what our government is doing in Muslim countries like Somalia. Now, I want to know from the minister, because I know that she's seen the Channel 4 dispatches program. I know that she's not going to stand up and claim that she didn't see it, even though she's answering a debate on human rights in Somalia in the House this evening. I know that she's seen the program. So I want to ask her to do a better job than Lord Malach Brown did in explaining why are we paying for from our taxes, taxes that amongst other things could be used to help starving people in Ethiopia or keep our pensioners warm in the winter or keep some of our post offices open as the Minister for Closing Post Offices is by your chair. I hope he's in the house and it's in order for me to refer to him. Money that we could have used for a better purpose is being spent on the security forces in Somalia, which are accused by Amnesty International, as well as by Channel 4, of widespread abuses of human rights, of torture, of murder, of disappearance, of kidnapping, extortion and grand larceny. Why are we allowing the Minister of the Interior of Somalia to travel back and forward into our country unmolested when he's accused by aid agencies of purloining international aid, desperately needed emergency aid for hungry people, for himself and for political purposes, for his political plan. 
Why isn't the government stopping them at the border, questioning them about where the money went that was put into Somalia and has disappeared? Aid agencies will not set foot by and large now in Somalia. So catastrophic has the situation become. I want to ask the minister why we are supporting a president, an interior minister, a chief of police in Somalia, allowing them freely to come and go without answering the charges that are being made against them. When will the government at least condemn the human rights abuses in Somalia? Amnesty International has voluminously recorded them, but not a squeak from the government that's never done roaring at Sudan or Zimbabwe. Why? Because we are deeply complicit in it. Indeed, we are paying for it. We are paying for the security services that are committing these crimes in Somalia. Now, the government may think that because most Somalis in Britain don't have votes for one reason or another, that tall as they are, they can be ignored. But the truth is, this is a ticking time bomb inside our own country. The loathing from the Somali community in Britain of the actions of our government is a ticking time bomb in Britain. I, if not she, am constantly exposed in my own constituency and in Birmingham and Leicester and other places to the anger of these young Somalis. It's a disaster waiting to happen, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I hope that the Minister will announce today that she will, in the, in the wake of Channel 4's revelations, investigate properly these, investi these uh, allegations, and she will report to the House her findings on that matter. The truth is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, our government's foreign policy towards this Horn of Africa towards Afghanistan, and not just this government, previous British governments too. I sat in the opposition, accusing the then Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, of having opened the gates to the barbarians with her support for the so-called Mujahideen in Afghanistan all those many years ago. Mr Deputy Speaker, you will perhaps recall it yourself. This policy which our governments have followed of my enemy's enemy is my friend, is a fatally flawed policy. It's fatally flawed everywhere that it's been tried and it's now being tried all over again in Somalia. So for the sake of the many Somalis who are watching this, because the word is out in the Somali community about this debate this evening, for the sake of the people on Universal TV and other Somali channels who will show this debate, I hope that the Minister will come clean about the dreadful problems that exist. And I hope she'll say to the Ethiopian government, the Honourable General wishes to give way. The Honourable General giving way. Can I congratulate him on, on, on his success in getting this uh, debate this evening? I apologise that I've arrived late, Mr Deputy Speaker. It caught me uh, slightly unawares. Um, uh, what's best for the uh, Somalian people and Somalia itself, of course, is security. Does the Honourable Gentleman accept that the Ethiopian government are providing security in Somalia at the moment and they want to withdraw from Somalia at the earliest possible moment? And would he join me in encouraging the United Nations and an Amazon and also the African Union to ensure that troops are put back into Somalia in order to give Somalis that security that they need? Ethiopian troops want to return to Addis Ababa. Well, I don't accept it. I don't accept it at all, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I know the Ethiopian government rather better, it seems, than the honourable gentleman. As I explained before he came in, I knew them when they were pro-Albanian Maoist guerrillas in the TPLF. I knew all their leaders who are now the government ministers. I know that they have no intention of withdrawing from Somalia unless they're forced to. They want to occupy Somalia because they've been paid to do so. And they were paid to do so by the governments of the United States and by our own government. They're doing a job for what they imagine to be the Western international, Western part of the international community. Well, the, the Minister for, for Closing Post Offices laughs, but he has many Somalis in his constituency, as I have in mine. And I hope that the camera caught him laughing. The truth is, 
I do apologise for intervening on the Honourable Gentleman. I didn't laugh at anything he's been saying so far. Well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll not go further down that uh, track. Perhaps the camera caught the uh, verisimilitude. The truth is that the Ethiopian government is carrying out a service for the people who give it weapons, for the people who give it money, and for the people who give it diplomatic and political support. They're having a bino in the Ethiopian embassy next week. Perhaps the honourable gentleman is going. He'll certainly get an invitation in the post after his, after his uh, intervention on my speech. They're having a bino to celebrate the 17th anniversary in the Ethiopian embassy in London of their coming to power. It's going to be a very grand event. This at a time when their own people are starving to death. Their children are starving to death, 120,000 of them, with a month to live, and they're invading and occupying their neighbouring countries. And nobody says boo about it. In fact, far from saying boo, they say, here's some more military and some more financial aid to do it. Because the government of President Bush, utterly discredited on its way out, with virtually nowhere to go except Downing Street on Sunday for one last photo call, regards that the defeat of the former Islamic government in Somalia as part of its war on terror. That's what this is all about. Ethiopia is playing the role of hammer in the Horn of Africa for the United States policy and its war on terror. That's what Ethiopia are doing, and therefore they will not withdraw until a new American government, hopefully with a Kenyan-affiliated president, tells them that actually this policy is deeply flawed, because the puppet regime of British citizens imposed on Somalia by the Ethiopian invasion wouldn't last five minutes if the Ethiopian forces withdrew. They'd have to withdraw with it. And so any government that's going to come to power in Somalia in the future will be filled with hatred of Britain and the United States. This is the problem we keep making everywhere. We intervene either to prop up tyrants or to support tyrants because we don't like the tyrants they're fighting against. And then we generate still more problems for ourselves. And we wonder why. And we agonizingly debate anti-terrorism laws why so many people in the Muslim world want to hurt us? Why so many young people in the Muslim world are so bitter and angry about us that they want to hurt us? Well, is it any wonder? Can it be any wonder to any sane person? I'm giving way in a second to the honorable gentleman. Can it be any wonder it's these kind of policies? I, I, I beg the minister to believe me because I'm talking to Somalis all the time. The rage felt in the Somali community in Britain and around the world about Britain and America's role in their country is generating a terrorist. Let me spell it out as the uh, right honourable gentleman who saved the government's bacon earlier uh, this evening is now in his place. Let me spell it out as we spent so many hours discussing anti-terrorism. We are making new terrorists in Britain with our policy towards Somalia, with our double standards. With our hypocrisy, I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. So the Honourable uh, Gentleman has been very generous. Whilst the uh, government of Ethiopia is not perfect, and indeed there are governments closer to home uh, that aren't perfect, and, and it's absolutely right that human rights abuses by the S uh, Somali security services are fully investigated, does nevertheless he accept that if Ethiopian troops at this current time withdrew, that would create a security vacuum into which terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda, would create mayhem in the Horn of Africa, a key and strategic location, and that would come back to haunt us. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, I said in this house over there, when we recalled the house just a few days after the atrocity of 9-11, if you'll forgive me quoting myself, I said, if we handle this the wrong way, we'll make 10,000 new bin Ladens. And we have handled it the wrong way. And we have made 10,000 new bin Ladens. And the problem of Al-Qaeda in Somalia has been made worse by the Western intervention and the Ethiopian invasion. Far more people have been recruited to a narrow, fundamentalist, separatist, violent Islamism by our policy than ever would have been if that policy 
had never been formed. The Honourable Gentleman obviously hasn't read this Amnesty International document. The Ethiopian forces are not providing security, they're providing mass murder and mass terror in the occupied Somalia. The refugee camps are full of two million people. No one can walk on the streets of Mogadishu. Channel 4's reporters were almost killed making their program. Some of their team on the same vehicle with them were shot dead live on television while they were making. Well, the honorable gentleman from a sedentary position says by Somalis. I don't know if they were by Somalis or by Ethiopians. The point is, the country has been plunged into utter lawlessness and to pretend that the Ethiopian government is providing security in a country with whom security should never be mentioned in the same sentence is completely ridiculous. There may be a need for African Union forces. There may be a need for Arab League forces. And I hope, in conclusion, and I'm sorry, I apologize to the Minister for taking a minute more than I ought to, but I'll close on this point. There may be a need for other forces. This conflict is going to go on. I hope the Minister is not going to claim that the deal reached this week is any kind of deal for solving this problem. Because the people who are doing the fighting are not involved in the deal. It would be like uh, a peace process in the north of Ireland, uh, which excluded the people who were doing the fighting. That's what's been reached uh, with relation to Somalia in the last few days. So I'm grateful to you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, even more grateful for the extra time that I got. And I apologize for my girlish point of order, which turned out to be entirely misconstrued. And I do hope that we get some answers from the minister this evening. Yeah. Meg Munn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to reply to the member for Bethnal Green and Bow on this debate. I see this as an excellent chance to highlight how the Foreign and Commonwealth Office seeks to address a number of issues relating to Somalia. 